Good evening. I'm Dr. Tushar Mehta. I'm an orthopedic surgeon and your faculty of orthopedics. Well, uh, today I'm coming on this platform with this video only for one particular reason that is to wish you all the best and a lot of good luck for your final NEET PG entrance exam. Uh, I just wanted to brush up a couple of important points, very <coughs> high yielding topics for orthopedics, which should be uh, revised and they are completely not to miss. So, without wasting any further time, uh, let me quickly jump onto the quick revision of orthopedics in this final lab. Let's begin. So, there are a couple of important clinical tests in orthopedics, and you know what we have seen in the last almost two, three, three and a half years that most of the papers, whether it is of INI set or you know, at one point of time there used to be AIMS or NEET PG or even in all India. Every time there used to be a clinical test or an MCQ related to the clinical test and usually this used to be in the format of an image based question. So let's try to identify this test. I mean the first test onto your left onto your screens right now. If this comes as an image based question, what do you think you are going to mark? You are going to mark the answer as AdSense test. And where do you see this AdSense test? You see this basically in thoracic outlet syndrome. The patient is asked to hyperextend the neck. You can very well see here is that patient is asked to hyperextend the neck. Then the patient is asked to rotate the neck towards the ipsy lateral side or you can say towards the side which you are going to examine. Now what the examiner is going to do is examiner if you can see is basically trying to palpate the radial pulse. Now the thing is that when we talk about thoracic outlet syndrome this is a condition where there is an undue pressure over the spare area because of which there is a compression not over only the you know the, the, the subclavian artery but also the brachial plexus. So now we have to provocate the symptoms, we have to reproduce the symptoms by asking the patient to hyperextend and rotate towards that side. Now, you know, the, the space which is already compromised because of an accessory rib, because of a cervical rib, that is what we call as thoracic outlet syndrome. So now if you have to reproduce those things, you will ask the patient. Now this particular maneuver till now that is hyperextension, epsilateral rotation has already compromised the diameter of this area. Now you ask the patient to take a deep breath. Patient is asked to take a deep breath and hold it. Now while the patient is inhaling and holding it, the examiner won't be able to feel this radial pulse. And the moment patient will leave that breath, the patient will exhale, the pulse will appear again and that is when we say okay fine ADSO and AdSense test for thoracic outlet syndrome positive. I hope that makes some sense to you. You can very well see this is what is called as phalanx test. No confusion at all here. This is what is called as phalanx test. It is basically for this condition called as carpal tunnel syndrome. A 20, 30 year old female coming to aeropathy telling you that in the night at around 2 to 30 when she is almost deep asleep, uh, she has this feeling of tingling and numbness in lateral three and a half fingers and due to which she has to do this time and again and then only, you know, her, her, her numbness goes away. So this is basically nothing but entrapment of the median nerve inside the carpal tunnel under the flexor retinaculum or the transverse carpal ligament. Again, it's a provocative test, phalanx test. As you can see, the patient is asked to basically palmar flex you can very well appreciate that there is palmar flexion of both the wrist and then the patient is asked to stand with the approximation of dorsum of both the hands uh, for a period of minimum 60 seconds if within 60 seconds the patient starts complaining of tingling and numbness in lateral three and a half fingers that means you have basically provocated the symptoms of tingling and numbness by forceful palmar flexion of both the wrist joint and that is what we call as phalanx test now when we talk about phalanx test we should and we have to talk about the durkin's test as well and before i go further i would like to tell all of you here that this is supposed to be the most specific test for carpal tunnel syndrome one test you have already heard that is basically the phalanx test second one we are discussing right now called the durkin's test there is one more after this that i'll be telling you that is about the tunnel sign but what i'm trying to tell you is that whether we talk about phalanx or we talk about durkin or we talk about tunnel it is the durkin which is considered to be the most specific now you can see this is basically the thumb of the examiner so what i'm trying to tell you is that there is a direct application of pressure 
by the thumb of the examiner so there is a direct application of pressure by the thumb of the examiner you can see this is again on the other side as well the other thumb is also trying to compress the median or inside the carpal tunnel as you can very well see this is a provocative test this is going to provocate the symptoms within 60 seconds it is going to provocate the symptoms of tingling and numbness in lateral three and a half fingers so this is what is called as Durkin's test this is basically one finger of the examiner which is basically trying to percuss so if you do the percussion of the median nerve inside the carpal tunnel so this is percussion of the median nerve inside the carpal tunnel so median nerve hair is exactly inside the carpal tunnel under the flexor tackleum if you percuss that and if that creates if that provocates your uh, symptoms of tingling and numbness in lateral three and a half fingers then this is what is called as tunnel sign and one mcq that came in one of the recent exam i've already told you these are the three important clinical tests for carpal tunnel syndrome but basically i wanted to understand that whether we talk about phalans or turkins or tunnel Durkin's is considered to be the most specific and then of course we have covered Adson's test for thoracic outlet syndrome moving further what do you think about this uh, what do you think about this test yes anybody any guesses anyone what about this test okay i'll tell you see all of you are technically aware of the fact that in the first extensor compartment you have two tendons which are apl and epb in the first extensor compartment there are two tendons which are abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis there are two tendons one is abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis so these are the two tendons in the first extensor compartment now the point is that they share a common tenosynovial sheath and if there is inflammation if there is tenosing tenosynovitis of these two tendons if the common synovial sheath of these two tendons that gets inflamed that is what we call as de Courvain's disease or de Courvain's tenosynovitis now what the test that we are doing here is again a provocative test and you can very well see that how are we going to provocate by the way the name of the test is Finkelstein test so what you are doing is if you see there is something called as radial deviation there is something called as ulnar deviation i'm sure you can very well appreciate that what we are doing here is an ulnar deviation because it is i mean you can do it on your own as well the moment you do an ulnar deviation that is going to stretch this common tenosynovial sheath of apl and epb and that is going to do a little provocation of the symptoms in you so again after carpal after the test for carpal tunnel syndrome fail in the continual there is another provocative test for the another condition that is called as finkelstein test we have one more test here can anybody tell me what is this maneuver representing anybody any idea what is this maneuver representing okay fine you can see with one hand examiner stabilizing the elbow all right with another hand what you are looking at right now is that the examiner is trying to do the palmar flexion now there is something called palmar flexion there is something called as dorsiflexion examiner is trying to do a palmar flexion okay and if the patient i mean basically we ask the patient to do the dorsiflexion or in other words i would make it a little simple for you this is flexion of the wrist this is extension of the wrist the exam the patient will try to the patient will try to extend the wrist and the examiner will try to resist it so i am trying to resist this is the hand of the examiner i am trying to resist the extension of the wrist by the patient and if that provocates pain around the lateral condyle actually this is not the lateral condyle the lateral condyle will be on the other side so if that provocates pain around the lateral condyle this is what is called as cousin's test another provocative test but bottom line is another provocative test for which condition for tennis elbow also what is called as also what is called as lateral epicondylitis the main muscle which is implicated as the pathogenesis in this condition is extensor carpi radialis brevis so if what i'm trying to tell you here is that if there is pain on resisted if there is pain on resisted extension of the wrist then that is what is called as cousin's test i hope that makes some sense to you now there are two more tests 
apart from cousin's test one that we have discussed here is what is called as cousin's test ye baat hum already kar chuke hain we already spoken about it that if there will be uh, if the patient will try to extend the wrist okay and if i try to resist that then if that produces pain here at the lateral condyle we call it ecrb inflammation not what we call as tennis elbow and this is called as an active uh, maneuver why because you are as a patient you are actively extending your elbow uh, extending uh, your wrist joint but there is one more test here that is called as mills test now what is mills test elbow is completely extended i'm sure you can very well appreciate that elbow here is completely extended now what this examiner is doing he is not doing some he is not throwing some resistance to the extension of the wrist no he is not throwing some sort of a resistance to the extension of the wrist he is doing a passive complete pronation he is doing if you see he is not asking patient to do anything all the examiner is going to do is going to do himself so he is doing a passive pronation and flexion if this passive pronation and flexion produces pain over the lateral epicondyle or condyle then that is what we call as that another uh, <coughs> provocative test for tennis elbow that is what is called as mills test so after cousin's test and mills test we have another test that is what is called as mortsley's test we have another test that is what is called as mortsley's test this is also called as middle finger extension test now the only thing is i'll tell you again if the exam if the patient is doing this and examiner is trying to stop him and if that produces pain have cousin's test if the patient is not doing anything but the examiner passively pronates and flexes his uh, wrist then that produces pain here that is called mills test if the examiner is if the patient is trying to extend the middle finger and if the examiner is trying to stop it and if that produces pain here that is what is called as middle finger extension test or mortsley's test now what do you think about this test if you see here then patient is asked to place the hand in such way that palm is facing the ceiling you can very well see that the palm or surface of the hand is facing the ceiling now if you see then this uh, this is a pen i'm sure you all can appreciate so you can see a pen is placed perpendicular to the plane of the palm okay a pen is placed perpendicular to the plane of the palm and the patient is asked to touch the tip of the pen with the tip of the thumb so technically what test are we talking about we are talking about pen test we are talking about pen test but there is one thing that i want you to remember that which tendon do we check abductor pollicis brevis which nerve is basically checked here the one which supplies abductor pollicis brevis that is median nerve so if the patient is asked to touch the tip of the pen with the tip of the thumb and if the patient is able to do those do so so abductor pollicis brevis is normal pen test is negative median nerve is intact after pen test i want you to talk about this is not forment actually this is froment so i want to talk about book test or also what is called as froment sign so if you ask me to hold a book that will be very simple if you ask me to hold a book i will use my another tendon that is what is called as an adductor pollicis i will use a thenar muscle called as adductor pollicis supplied by ulnar nerve so i will use my adductor pollicis supplied by ulnar nerve and i will hold the book now you will hold the book but you will not be able to take away the book because i have a very strong grip using my adductor pollicis supplied by ulnar nerve if i don't let you take out the book my book test is negative my froment sign is absent my ulnar nerve is normal my adductor pollicis is normal but if i am not able to use that but still i don't want you to take the book out of my hand so what i will do is rather than rather than using my adductor pollicis rather than using my adductor pollicis i will use a compensatory muscle that is flexor pollicis longus of the thumb and flexor deltoidum profundus of the index finger and i will try to stop it but it this grip will not be that strong and you will be able to easily take away the book so if you see in the image below if you see in this image below here what they have done is they have shown you that how a normal adductor pollicis supplied by ulnar nerve is acting and the grip over the book is so strong so this is a negative book test or a absent from and sign but if you see here then definitely you are using the flexor you are using the flexor pollicis longus of the thumb and you are using the flexor digitorum profundus of the index finger to hold the book rather than using a doctor pollicis 
all right so technically this is what is called as book test positive from and sign present on the nerve paralysis because this is checking which muscle adductor pollicis the nerve supply of which is on the nerve i hope that makes some sense to you now can you all tell me about this can you all tell me about this if i have to tell you that you look beautiful so i will say mm, i tell you that don't worry everything is okay so i will say okay sign so in okay you have a okay you have a zero you have a circle in okay sign so if if i show you then this is what is called as a normal okay sign and if i show you then this is what is called as weak okay sign now this weak okay sign is basically nothing but a part of kilonevin syndrome are also called as kilo nevin sign so you can very well see that fpl or fpl is lax here it is not working that much you can see that fdp is quite lax it is not working that much and basically it happens due to an involvement of what anterior interosseous nerve which is basically nothing but a motor branch of median nerve i hope that makes another sense to you Moving to my next image, you have to very quickly answer this. So, guys, you have had a book now. I will tell you something about card and Igawa. See, what is the job of palmar entrosia to do a deduction? What is the job of dorsal entrosia to do a deduction? Now, what I'm trying to show here is basically what is called as card test. And when we talk about card test, it is basically the palmar entrosia which are being checked. It is basically the a deduction which is being checked. It is basically the ulnar nerve which is being checked. If I talk about this dorsal entrosia, so this is basically what we are talking about here is an Igawa's test. So what we are checking here is dorsal entrosia, and we are checking what a b induction at fingers, and we are checking a nerve that is what is called as ulnar nerve. So guys, if I give you a card in between your fingers and if I ask you to hold that card between your fingers and if the examiner also holds that card, none of them is able to take it away from the other person. Both have a normal learner, normal permanent trochea, normal card test. But if I ask you to put your hand like this and if I put as an examiner, if I put my thumb and my finger around your thumb and uh, little finger and if I ask you to spread out your fingers, find out the, your fingers like this, that means your abduction is intact, your dorsal entrosia are intact, your agavas test is uh, negative. Are we able to understand this? Now moving over to my next test, if you see this test, then this is what is called as Thomas test, all right? This is what is called as Thomas test and this is a test which basically helps in uh, determining the flexion deformity at the level of hip and allegedly one of the important clinical tests from the lower extremity. There is no need to go into much detail of it. Now if you see then this is a Thomas test done in the supine posture then this is a another test which is done basically if you see it is done in the lateral posture it is done in the lateral position now if you see then this particular hip joint this particular hip joint is slightly extended this particular hip joint is slightly extended and slightly abducted and if you see then this knee is flexed by 90 degree so this knee is flexed by 90 degrees so examiner asks the patient to lie down in the lateral position extends the hip abducts the hip keeps the knee 90 degree flexion for a period of 60 to 120 seconds and then the examiner basically wants to put this limb back parallel to the contralateral limb is he if, he if he is able to do that we say that the iliotibial band is normal over test is negative if he is not able to do so if he is not able to do so then we say that no no this is over test positive and when we talk about over test it is basically a test to assess the iliotibial tendon or the iliotibial band contracture that is something which is important here moving further to another test that is what is called as allen's test which we have discussed in our lectures quite a few times so this is one thumb of the examiner this is thumb number one this is basically thumb number two here we are blocking the ulnar artery here we are blocking the radial artery and basically what we want to assess is the superficial palmar arch which is made by both of them 
all right so this is what we have to do is now what we do is we ask the patient to immediately flex extend flex extend flex extend all the fingers the moment patient does that there's a blanching of skin hair now what you do is you leave this pressure from the ulnar artery the moment you will leave the pressure from the ulnar artery this blanching will become red that means ulnar channel is patent you ask the patient you block the ulnar channel again you ask the patient to flex extend flex extend flex extend and then you remove the pressure from the radial artery this blanching will again become red and when this blanching will become red that means you know it will become red that means radial channel is patent so both the channels are patent okay superficial palmar arch is patent that is the fundamental behind allen's test uh, I'm sure you all will be able to appreciate this test. The patient is in supine posture, knee is in 90 degree flexion, examiner is sitting on the dorsum of the foot and holding the proximal tibia in such a way that two thumbs are under the tibial tuberosity while fingers are embracing the posterior part of the proximal leg. And now the examiner will try to exert a draw over tibia anteriorly with respect to femur. The examiner will try to exert a draw over tibia anteriorly with respect to femur and this is basically what is called as anterior drawers test. This is what is called as anterior drawer test for ACL tear. After anterior drawer test, there is one more test which I'm sure you all are aware of it that which is the best test for ACL. The best test is always the Latchman's test. In Latchman's test, there is no 90 degree flexion. You are not going to sit anywhere on the dorsum of the foot. The knee will be taken maximum into 30 degree flexion. With your left hand, you will be holding the distal part of the thigh. With your right hand, you will be holding the proximal tibia. And of course, what you will do is, as the name of the test says, that you have to exert a draw anteriorly. I mean, the process has to be same. You have to exert a draw anteriorly over tibia with respect to femur. If that happens, then the Latchman test is positive. Latchman test is positive are we able to understand this so this is the fundamental behind interior drawer and latchman now there is one more test apart from this this is what is called as this is what is called as mcmurray's test this is what is called as mcmurray's test now what you have to do in mcmurray's test is very simple as of now the knee is in hyperflexion as of now the knee is in hyperflexion so all you have to do is from this position of knee in hyperflexion you have to take into a position of extension so you can see like this okay so from this position of knee in hyperflexion you have to take this into knee in extension now while doing this while doing this you have to put your hand over the medial and the, you have to put your one hand over the medial and the lateral joint line and with the other hand what you have to do is you have to internal rotate the foot and you have to external rotate the foot okay so you have to put your thumb over the medial joint line finger over the outer joint line you have to hold the you know the leg from the other hand or the distal part of the leg from the other hand now the knee is in right now in hyperflexion so you will rotate it internally you will rotate the foot internally and then you will extend so patient will say tenderness over your fingers are lateral joint line tenderness when knee is taken from a position of hyperflexion to extension with foot in internal rotation now take that back into hyperflexion rotate that foot externally now take that foot a knee from hyperflexion to extension if there is tenderness where your thumb is middle joint line tenderness we'll say mcmurray's test for middle meniscus posture now this is basically mcmurray's test for meniscal tear as we all know there is one more thing that i want you to understand here is although it is an obsolete test that is what is called as apley's grinding test now you can very well see that patient is in prone position there is no doubt about it knee is in 90 degree flexion there is no doubt about it it is an obsolete test by the way it, it's an obsolete test which is the best test is it the mcmurray's test no the best test is always the medial joint line or the lateral joint line tenderness eliciting tenderness is the best test anyhow so you can see that foot has been taken into external rotation and one two three ta, downward thrust will be applied Foot is in external rotation, patient is in prone position, knees in 90 degree flexion, downward thrust will be applied, the patient will cry. Why? Because there is pain over the medial joint line. Because there is absence of the middle meniscus, the middle cushion, the middle shock absorber and the middle condyle of the femur and tibia, they will rub against each other which will give rise to pain. So again, of course, you can very well see we are kind of grinding. So this is called as Apley's grinding test. This is one question that I wanted to discuss after this, you know, spectrum of clinical tests. There is one thing that I wanted to discuss. 
23 year old athletic male who is into active marathon running for last two years okay develops spleen over the medial tibial ridge which is worse in the beginning of the exercise but yes when you stop doing the exercise within a couple of minutes that pain goes away what do you think about this i will tell you the diagnosis is very simple the diagnosis is what is called as shin splints also called as MTSS. Now, what is MTSS? MTSS is medial tibial stress syndrome. Medial tibial stress syndrome. Now, if you see this x ray, so in this x ray, on a lateral view, you can definitely see something wrong here. On an AP view, probably something wrong here. Now, what is the basic pathophysiology behind it? What is the MRI staging? What is the fundamental behind shin splint? What is medial tibial stress syndrome? Why it happens in athletes? Why it happens in first couple of minutes of exercise? And then gradually it increases. And what is the fundamental behind it? See, basically you have to understand the keyword here is in the pathophysiology, the keyword here is that it is nothing but a periostitis. It is an inflammation of the level life of a bone that is what is called as periosteum. Why? Because see, you have to understand that a bone called tibia is constantly under strain. A bone called tibia is constantly under a lot of strain, strain, strain. And that a lot of strain which is coming onto the tibia time and again is the reason why the periosteum of the tibia undergoes into inflammation. So that periosteitis is something that has happened on a regular basis. Now, what happens after periosteitis is that, you know, we as a, I mean, our bones, uh, they have got an innate capability to remodel. So you have periosteal inflammation, you have periosteitis, but then this periosteum will assume a chance to go into remodeling. That will create kind of some, kind, some kind of a stress reaction or some kind of a stress fracture. So there is for sure a stress fracture in the advanced stages due to periosteal remodeling that happens after a phase of periosteitis that the healing does does not happen properly along with of course there is dysfunction of the tibialis anterior the posterior the gastroc soleus and all those things so this is about mtss there is a Fredrickson classification there is a Fredrickson classification uh, uh, depending upon the mri because initially the gold standard uh, condition uh, the gold standard investigation for this condition was supposed to be bone scan not now we take it to be mri and there is grade one then two three and then four grade one is very simple all you have is a periosteal edema grade two you don't have only a periosteal edema but you have a marrow edema you have a medullary edema there's a progressive marrow edema grade four you have a typical cortical stress fracture so grade one two three four one is very simple periosteal edema two is uh, progressive periosteal and marrow edema three is complete stress fracture in the cortex Fredrickson staging MRI based staging bottom line for uh, medial tibial stress syndrome on an MRI now if you have to identify you know this very important instrument here you can very well see these cutting edges I'm sure it is quite visible to you that these sharp cutting edges are used to just to cut the bone they will be used to cut the bone so it's technically a bone cutter as mentioned if you see the edges they are basically hollow from within as if you know they have to first catch hold of something and then take it away and then you have to nibble it away so it is a bone nibbler so everything depends upon the you know the curvature of the edges on inside if they're sharp cutting edges cutter if they're hollow from within then it is bone nibbler now what is this is a plate holding forceps how do you identify plate holding forceps one very simple way to identify that one sort of edges are if you see these are basically serrated edges if you see these are serrated edges and if you see these edges these are basically flat edges there is no serration so this serrated side and flat side is very important flat side is usually for the plate and serrated side is mainly basically for the bone so plate holding forceps is basically used to attach a plate to the bone Alright, so this is a plate holding forceps. Now I will show you uh, one bone holding forceps which has serrations if you see on both the sides. So this has basically serrations here. This has basically serrations here. So this is a hay groves bone holding for here. So if you have to hold just a bone against a bone or if you have to hold the two fragments of the bone together, you have to use a bone holding forceps. If you have to hold a bone against a plate, you have to use a plate holding forceps. So plate holding will have one edge serrated, one edge flat and smooth maybe you can say uh, plate holding will have something like that bone holding will have both the edges serrated now what do you think about these thing these three instruments here anybody any idea so this is what is called as Farabuf periosteal elevator one frequently asked mcq 
this is basically this is used to lift the periosteum elevate the periosteum if you want to do something extra periosteal you want that periosteum should be spared and then you have to let's say you have to put a plate you have to put a uh, let's say a locking plate you can uh, i mean if you're if you're putting a locking plate it's fine but if you're putting a dcp or an lcdcp you wouldn't want that to completely compress the periosteum so you want to lift off the periosteum you do it with the help of a periosteal elevator now if you see this this is basically a bone lever it is used to lever out the bone let's say for example you are operating in areas of depth let's say thigh let's say uh, you are operating from the lateral approach there is vastus lateralis irritable band tensor facial lot there is a lot of soft tissue you want to just liver out the fracture fragment of the femur so you will use a bone liver by the way this was given by homan so it is called as homan's bone liver now you have another bone liver here now this bone liver is basically for the smaller bones by the way this is what is called as bristow's bone liver now what do you think about this fracture i will tell you what you have to think about this fracture that you you have a fracture of patella in front of you now guys if you see then quadriceps tendon is one tendon which will always pull the superior pole of the fracture patella up ligamentum patelli is another reason in the soft tissue which will always pull the inferior pole down so you can see a fractured patella where there is a superior pole, where there is an inferior pole. Superior pole is being pulled up by quads, inferior pole is being pulled down by the ligamentum patelli as you can see. And now we have to fix this fracture. How do you fix this fracture? You fix this fracture with this surgical modality that is what is called as tension band wiring. Its job is to convert, its job is to, this is what we call as TBW. So its job is to convert the distraction forces. Its job is to convert the distraction forces into compressive forces. Its job is to convert the distractive forces, the distraction forces into compressive forces. Let us say for example fracture olecranon fracture uh, patella as you have seen here it is also used in various other fractures like greater to greater to canter greater to velocity medial malleolus lateral malleolus but the bottom line is that it will convert the distractive forces into compressive forces that is the fundamental behind it when we talk about uh, fracture patella, when we talk about TBW, we talk about patella, which we know is the largest sesamoid bone, but we have to talk about a very important plaster cast, which is used in uh, fracture of the patella. This is what is called as a cylinder cast or a tube cast for non-displaced fractures of the patella we use this now there is a very interesting thing that i want all my students to know that a cylinder why do we call it a cylinder cast or a tube cast if you see the shape is almost like that of a cylinder and if you see it starts just above the middle of the thigh it starts just above the middle of the thigh and it extends just above the mandula guys you should appreciate and you should notice that mandula are not a part of this cast cylinder cast tube cast fracture patella now at the same time you have one more cast here that is what is called as ptb cast this is what is called as patellar tendon bearing cast now this patellar tendon bearing cast is something which we use for fracture shaft of tibia all right so this is something that we use for fracture shaft of tibia you can very well see how much is the extent because it is quite possible that it, this might come as an image based question so you can see a patella you can see the patella tendon then of course you have the tibia so it is used for fracture of the shaft of the tibia it is a kind of a functional cast given by sarmiento this is what is called as a below knee cast bk cast and this is what is called as an ak cast many students they get confused with the ak and a cylinder cast very simple they both start at the same point but their finishing point is different foot and mallow are not involved a cylinder cast foot and mallow are involved above knee cast moving further to my <coughs> moving further to my next topic here i'm sure you all will be able to appreciate this deformity this deformity is what is called as genu varum varus what do you whatever you want to call it this is basically also called as bolex if you see this deformity then i'm sure you all are intelligent enough to know that this is what is called as genu valgus genu valgum whatever this is what is called as tuck 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 knock knees and this is something if you see is coming here and 
ठीक है हवा का झोंका आया उड़ा के ले गया सो दिस इज वॉट इज कॉल्ड एज विंड स्वेप्ड डिफॉर्मिटी द चैप इज क्वाइट हैप्पी एज वेल सो दिस इज वॉट इज कॉल्ड एज विंड स्वेप डिफॉर्मिटी इफ वी टॉक अबाउट चिल्ड्रन इफ वी टॉक अबाउट चिल्ड्रन द मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज ऑफ जीनो वायरस इन चिल्ड्रन इज रिकेट्स फॉलोड बाई इडियोपैथिक If we talk about the most common cause in children, it is basically rickets followed by idiopathic. If we talk about the most common cause of wind swept deformity in, of course, children, it is rickets. If we talk about the most common cause of this condition, it is basically in children. It is basically idiopathic followed by rickets. In children, it is idiopathic, followed by rickets. I hope that makes some sense to you. Again, certain features of rickets: you can see the racketic rosary, you can see the metaphyseal prominence, the cupping, splaying, fraying will be seen, of course, on an X-ray. So, just wanted to give you a brief overview about this condition. Now, this is something again that I want you to understand: that if your distal interphalangeal joint is flexed, if your distal interphalangeal joint is flexed then that is what is called as mallet finger if the dip is flexed then that is called as mallet finger and why it happens it happens basically due to it basically happens due to a rupture of extensor tendon it basically happens due to rupture of extensor tendon after mallet finger we have bautonayer deformity so when we talk when we talk about bautonayer deformity please try to understand that pip is in flexion and dip is in extension pip is in flexion dip in extension that is called as bautonayer deformity then we have swan neck deformity in swan neck deformity the dip if you see the dip if you see that is in flexion while the pip if you see that is in extension or hyperextension so this is the difference between this is the difference between a mallet finger a swan neck deformity okay a swan neck deformity and then a bautonayer deformity so basically if you see something like this it is called as mallet finger if you see something like this like this like this then this is pip this is dip then this is what is called as come on speak up this is called as swan neck but if you see something like this like this like this then if this is dip this is dip then this is what is called as bautonayer deformity well when we talk about the menisci there is one thing that i want you to understand that the inner one third of the meniscus is considered to be the white white zone because it is completely avascular this is the inner one third now when we talk about the middle one third the middle one third is considered to be the red white zone that is partly vascular and partly not vascular when we talk about the outer one third this is something which is comparatively called as the red red zone i hope you get some sense out of it so inner one third is white white middle one third is red white outer one third is red red so that means this outer one third has the maximum vascularity and when i say it has the maximum vascularity that means it has the maximum uh, chances of repair it has the maximum chances of repair well when we talk about the inner one third inner one third is completely avascular when i say it is completely avascular that means there are hardly any chances of repair so any tear in the inner one third you have to remove the meniscus the next sign after this that we have to discuss is what is called as the popeye sign the next one that we have to discuss here is what is called as the popeye sign now when we talk about the popeye sign this is basically the biceps tendon rupture popeye sign is basically the biceps tendon rupture now you have to tell me that which tendon i mean of course it is the biceps tendon rupture but which head it is the long head or the short head it is usually the long head that gets ruptured now this long head gets ruptured where proximally or distally it usually gets ruptured proximally therefore you see the collection of this uh, muscle belly in the distal part giving rise to a popeye sign 
So again, a recent year question. Now there are a couple of braces which have been asked in the past. So what do you think about this brace on to your left? Yes, anybody. What do you think about this brace which has a posterior handle, which has two interior handle and which has this pelvic mold? What do you think about this brace? So this is what is called as Milwaukee brace. This is what is called as Milwaukee brace. But if you see on this side, this is what is called as Boston brace. Now, whether it is Milwaukee brace, whether it is Boston brace, both are seen in one condition and that is scoliosis. Now, what do you think about this? Okay, what do you think about this? Anybody? Now, this is what is called as a she brace. Now, when I say a she brace, what does that mean? That means anterior spinal anterior spinal hyperextension brace now this anterior spinal hyperextension brace is something that we use in <coughs> cervical oblique dorsal spine trauma usually we use it in dorsal spine trauma dorsal or dorsal lumbar so usually we use it in dorsal or dorsal lumbar spine trauma anterior spinal hyperextension brace more or less looks like this now what do you think about this case anybody anybody any idea so this is basically what is very frequently used i'm sure most of you must you must have seen this in clinics orthopedic ward orthopedic opds neurosurgery opds taylor's brace so in thoracic spine i repeat that in thoracic spine whenever you have t4 tb whenever you have t4 trauma whenever you have t4 tumor we use t4 taylor's brace so t4 tb t4 trauma t4 tumor and t4 thoracic spine we use t4 taylor's brace now uh, can you all identify that like if this man i mean I've, I've asked this man to extend both the wrist left side wrist extension left hopefully this is the left side so left wrist extension is absolutely normal and here if you can see this is clearly something which is evident it is a case of a wrist and a finger drop so probably it is a wrist drop now this photograph is showing a wrist drop when we talk about wrist drop that means which nerve is gone radial nerve palsy has happened okay so maybe a motor branch posterior interosseous nerve but bottom line is radial nerve palsy which splint is given in uh, radial nerve palsy which splint is given in uh, wrist drop the splint that we give is basically cock up splint on one side we have a static cock up splint on another side we have is something that is what is called as a dynamic cock up splint so you can see a static cock up for yourself and a dynamic cock up for yourself now after this let's talk about these two conditions what do you think about this now many people they get confused they say sir this is claw hand now please try to understand this is what is called as claw hand i totally agree i don't deny rather this is what is called as i would say ulnar claw hand due to ulnar paralysis you can very well see that there is a partial flexion of the fourth and the fifth finger there's a clawing of the fourth and the fifth finger because that is supplied precisely by the ulnar nerve and i must tell you that please notice one very identifying feature for the ulnar claw hand is basically hyper extension at the metacarpophalangeal and the proximal interphalangeal joint well this is what is called as benediction attitude this is what is called as benediction attitude this is what is called as pointing index now this is basically occurring due to paralysis of which nerve since ulnar nerve is normal so this is flex this is flex this is partially flex this is not flex so this is what is called as benediction attitude pointing index while the figure on the left hand side is what is called as ulnar claw and i want you to be very focused about these images Moving further, uh, ulnar claw hand, what is the splint that we give for ulnar claw hand or basic name of the splint is knuckle bender splint. I'm sure you all can appreciate what is the splint that we give for wrist drop. We already have seen that it's a cock up splint. So, I mean, I've told you what's a static cock up, what's a dynamic cock up. Now I'm telling you about a knuckle bender splint, but basically how to identify on an, in an exam when you see an image, you see the metacarpals. If the metacarpals are uh, fixed, if they're involved, then it is a knuckle bender. If the metacarpals are free, then it's a cock up. Now this is what is called as ankle foot orthosis. This is 
what is called as ankle foot orthosis now this ankle foot orthosis is something that you give in a foot drop or a cpn palsy common peroneal nerve palsy this is an image of that now guys can you tell me something about this x-ray what do you see in this x-ray what do you think has happened probably an x-ray of the spine where you know this is one vertebral body height this is another vertebral body height but what has happened to this vertebral body height there's a collapse plus apart from that you can see that the superior end plate is concave the inferior end plate is concave so what we are talking about here is called as a fish mouth spine or a so you can call it a fish mouth spine you can call it a cord fish spine so you can call it a fish mouth spine or you can call it a cord fish spine or you can call it a biconcave vertebrae so you can call it a fish mouth spine or a cord fish spine or a biconcave vertebra now the interesting part is that it is seen in two conditions what is one is what is called as osteomalacia the other one is what is called as osteoporosis so it is one x-ray feature which can be seen in both the conditions if you have to choose one then please choose m4 mouth is more classical of m4 malacia now since we have spoken about it i think we should talk about what are the basic differences between the osteomalacia and what are the basic differences between osteomalacia and osteoporosis now the first thing that i want you to remember is that this is basically a qualitative defect always remember that osteomalacia is a qualitative defect well when we talk about osteoporosis this is essentially a quantitative defect this is essentially a quantitative defect now osteomalacia is something that is seen in of course younger females this is something that you see in elderly females usually the 60s usually the 40s and 50s now in osteomalacia there is one thing that i want you to understand which is i think probably is very important is this that in osteomalacia the serum calcium will be low the serum phosphate will be low the serum alp level will be high well when we talk about osteoporosis the serum calcium will be normal the serum phosphate will be normal the serum alkaline phosphatase will be normal every damn thing will be normal this is very interesting by the way now here in x-ray you will see something that is called as precisely loser zone one of the classical hallmark here in x-ray you will see i mean you will see many things but you will see fish mouth spine now i have already told you that fish mouth spine is something that you see here as well so fish mouth spine is seen in both but it is more classical of osteomalacia here there is as such i'll be very honest in telling you there is no investigation of choice i mean you can go for a bone biopsy but in that bone biopsy you will be able to see something called as osteoid seams there will be excess stacking of osteoid over one another but this is just a theoretical concept nobody does a biopsy to confirm it yes here you have an investigation of choice and that is what is called as dexa scan now another interesting thing is that here in the treatment you have to take care of the vitamin whether you give it in the diet or you take in the form of medicines you have to take calcium again in the form of a diet or in the form of a medicine here when we talk about them definitely the drug of choice is bisphosphonate as we all know which is an anti resorptive drug whose job is to inhibit the osteoclastic activity so these are the basic lines of difference that i want you to understand now this is something which has been quite in fashion these days that typical x-ray picture of chronic osteomyelitis now when we talk about a typical x-ray picture of chronic osteomyelitis we have to understand that if it comes in the form of an image based question then this central dead piece of bone then this central dead piece of bone ischemic piece of bone necrotic piece of bone excessively white piece of bone is what is called as as i've already mentioned here sequestrum i'm sure you all are aware of the fact that this central dead radio dense ischemic necrotic and healthy non viable non vital piece of bone which is a pathological hallmark of chronic osteomyelitis basically acting as an adhesive of infection is surrounded by it is surrounded by what it is surrounded by an effort of the periosteum to make new more bone so that it is so you have to understand that this basically is the 
bone which is reactive immature subperiosteal healthy new bone which is formed as a part of the periosteal reaction around the sequestrum and that is what is called as involute so this excess bone this reactive immature subperiosteal new bone formed around the sequestrum is called involucrum while that dead radio dense piece of bone is called sequestrum now in this involucrum you will see small small holes so these are what are called as cloicae. Cloicae are basically the holes in involucrum. Cloicae are basically the holes in the involucrum through which pus and sequestrum exudes out. So this is how you radiologically identify. I'll show you one more and probably a better image of sequestrum. You can very well see that radio dense ischemic necrotic and healthy non viable non vital piece of bone that is what is called as sequestrum. Are we able to understand this? Now guys, let's move on to certain fractures and I see a lot of queries even now that students are getting confused between Coley's and Smith Barton and Schofer. Let's try to identify. Can you see a fracture? Of course, you can see a fracture. So is this fracture extending into distal radial articular surface? That's your first job as a student to identify whether that fracture of the distal end of the radius extending into this joint or not. So this is definitely an intra-articular fracture. There is no doubt about it. So it is an intra-articular fracture of distal end of radius there is no doubt about it it is an intra-articular fracture of distal end of radius now if you see then this is the ulnar stalloid and if you see then this is the radial stalloid so you can very well see that there is a radial styloid bony fragment so you can very well see that there is a radial styloid bony fragment here so this fracture what you are looking at right now is what is called as Schoffer's fracture also what is called as Hutchinson's fracture also called as kickback fracture also called as backfire fracture. So all the names are given to the same fracture whether you call it Schoffer or Hutchinson or kickback or backfire. So intra-articular fracture, distal end of the radius, radial steroid fragment and extending into the distal radial articular surface and a very interesting thing that the radioscaphoid joint is absolutely intact. You can see the anatomy is intact. If you see this, you can very well see in an AP view that this is completely, you know, a fracture line. I mean, this is probably one fragment and the other fragment is this. It has overlapped. So it is again a fracture of the distal end of the radius extending into the distal radial articular surface, of course. So is this an intra-articular fracture of the distal end of the radius? Of course, you have the radius here. You have the scaphoid here. So definitely there is a radio scaphoid joint subluxation. There is no doubt about it. As such, I cannot see a radial steroid bony fracture and by the way, this fracture is what is called as Barton's fracture. So whether it is Schofer, whether it is Barton, both are at the distal end of the radius, yes. Both are extending into the rest joint, yes. So what is the difference? In Schofer, you have a radial steroid fragment, in Barton, you don't. In Schofer, you have an intact radius of joint anatomy, here you have a radius of joint subluxation. Now moving further to my next fracture, you can very well see the distal radial articular surface is completely intact. There is no doubt and no confusion. So it is an extra, I mean you can see in the lateral view as well. The distal radial articular surface is absolutely intact. So this is an extra articular fracture of the distal end of the radius. There is no confusion. Now this side is the dorsal side or what you call as the posterior side. This is the interior side also called as the volar side. This is the proximal fragment. This is the distal fragment. And if you see then the distal fragment is going anteriorly or volarly. So there is an extra articular fracture or of distal end of radius with anterior oblique volar displacement with anterior oblique volar displacement of distal fragment now this fracture what you are looking at right now is called as Smith's fracture or also what is called as reverse Coley's fractures this is what you call as Smith's fracture or reverse Coley's fracture which I'm sure you can appreciate here now apart from Smith's fracture or reverse Coley's fracture there is one more fracture that you can see here is which is technically our most important fracture the one that probably is you know inevitable in every exam you can see an extra articular fracture here this extra articular fracture of the distal end of the radius i'm sure you can very well appreciate now this is having a dorsal displacement this is having a dorsal displacement of the distal fragment 
so there is a dorsal displacement of the distal fragment so this fracture what we have here is what is called as coli's fracture and i'm sure you can appreciate a malunited coli's here this malunited coli's is basically given rise to which deformity dinner fork deformity which is seen in otherwise made lungs deformity as well so that is why the dinner fork deformity that i mean i'm sure you can appreciate the dinner fork i'm sure you can appreciate the dinner fork so this dinner fork deformity that you see in coli's fracture is also what is called as pseudo made lungs deformity so you call it a pseudo made lungs deformity made lung is something different that's a congenital deformity we have discussed in all our lectures previously so that's a congenital deformity where there is a growth retardation of the ulnar aspect of the distal radial physis due to which there is abnormally protuberant and prominent ulna so that is different this is different i hope this all makes some sense to you now moving further how to apply coli's cast see there is this thing that i want you to remember that whenever you are applying for coli's cast first you have to exaggerate the deformity by the way what is the deformity what are the, what are the displacements so we know that the mnemonic is very simple dils so this is the mnemonic for the deformity in coli's fracture that is dils so you have a dorsal displacement you have impaction you have lateral displacement and you have supination so the first thing that you have to do is you have to apply traction why because you have to do the disimpaction but when you do the when you apply the traction then you have to apply traction uh, with wrist and dorsiflexion so what i'm trying to tell you is my dear friends that first you have to exaggerate the deformity so not only you will be applying a traction but you will there is already a dorsal displacement so you will do it you will take it into dorsal displacement so first you make it worse then you correct it that is a mantra here first you make it worse first you make it first make it worse 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 then make it better 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 so that is a mantra of the thing here that first you apply traction with wrist and dorsiflexion now you have disimpacted after disimpaction then you take it into palmar flexion then you take it into pronation and ulnar deviation so traction disimpaction and dorsiflexion is done the second step will be palmar flexion take the wrist into palmar flexion the third step will be of course pronation and of course ulnar deviation so this is how you know the the this is the steps i'm not uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you all have been through the previous questions so this is one of the previously asked question so this is how you apply this is this is the steps these are the steps in the application of the coli's cast or also what is called as hand shake cast where you have almost 15 degrees of pronation 15 degrees of palmar flexion 15 degrees of ulnar deviation so this is the position of the coli's cast now moving further to our next fracture if you see this x ray you will be able to identify that this is humerus this is radius this is ulna you can very well see that there is a fracture in the proximal 1/3 of ulnar shaft and along with that fracture of the proximal 1/3 of the ulnar shaft i'm sure all you students are intelligent enough to understand that there is a radial head dislocation so now this fracture of the proximal 1/3 of the ulnar shaft along with radial head dislocation is what is called as come on speak up montegias fracture so this is what is called as montegias fracture which is having a very important classification called as bedos classification and i'm sure you all are aware of the fact that this radial neck is surrounded by the nerve that is what is called as posterior interosseous nerve so most common nerve injury in this fracture as we have discussed couple of times in our lecture previously is posterior interosseous nerve which is a motor branch of radial nerve so i presume that montegia is clear now moving over to the next fracture i'm sure you all see this is radius this is ulna there is a fracture here so fracture is there in the shaft of radius yes fracture is there i repeat my words fracture is there in the shaft of the radius yes fracture is there in the shaft of the radius at the junction of at the junction of middle and distal 1/3 yes so there is a fracture in the shaft of the radius yes at the junction of middle and distal 1/3 yes with d r u j all right 
with DRUJ that is distal radio ulnar joint disruption. So there is a fracture of the shaft of the radius at the junction of middle and distal one third with distal radial nerve joint disruption. I'm sure you all have understood that I'm talking about which fracture, Galeazzi's fracture, also called as reverse Montegia's fracture, also called as Piedmont's fracture. My dear students, always remember that its clinical occurrence and incidence is three times more common than Montegia fracture. Its clinical occurrence incidence is three times more common. Now, what do you think about this fracture where there is just an isolated fracture of shaft of ulna? What do you think about this fracture where you have an isolated fracture of shaft of ulna? What do you think about this fracture, by the way? This is called as nightstick fracture. When somebody blows a nightstick on you and in your defense you do this on an assault, then this is called as isolated fracture of shaft of ulna, called as nightstick fracture. I am not asking you that, you know, what is this bone? I know it's humerus. I am not asking you what is this fracture. I know this is a fracture at the shaft of the humerus at the junction of upper two third and distal one third. I am not asking you that whether this fracture is transverse. I know it is not. Whether it is spiral, I know it is not. It is an oblique fracture. I am asking you only one thing. What is the nerve injury associated with this fracture? Answer is radial nerve. By the way, what is the name of this fracture? The name of this fracture is Holston Louis fracture. All right. So this is a classical oblique fracture of shaft of humerus. Oblique fracture of shaft of humerus, and it is basically seen at the junction of upper two third and lower one third. And the most interesting part is that it is always associated with what come on speak up radial nerve palsy always associated with radial nerve palsy so this is called as Holston Louis fracture now can you see a fracture of course is it in the scaphoid bone no lunate bone no radius bone yes distal end yes there is something called as lunate fossa is that fracture in the distal end of the radius in the lunate fossa? Yes. Is that fracture extending into the distal radial articular surface? Yes. So will you call this as an intra-articular fracture of distal end of radius? Yes. Is it through the lunate fossa? Yes. Now the most interesting point and the part here is that this is what is called as die punch fracture. The most interesting part is that this is called as Dishum die punch fracture. It is basically a depressed fracture. It is basically a depressed fracture called as die punch fracture. Moving over to the next fracture, uh, we all are aware of the fact that this is trapezium. In the other image, also, if you see, this is trapezium. And definitely there is no confusion that this is first metacarpal, this is first metacarpal. You have a fracture here like this. You have a fracture. Is this transverse? No. So this is classically an oblique fracture. Of course, this is extending into the wrist joint. Of course, uh, this is extending into trapezium first metacarpal joint. Of course, this is intraarticular. Of course, this is displaced. Of course. By the way, this is what is called as Bennett's fracture. This is what is called as Bennett's fracture. Now, if you see here, then again, this is an intra-articular fracture. But the interesting point is that it is TVY shaped fracture. Then there is one more thing that this is comminuted fracture. All right, this is comminuted fracture. And this is what is called as Rolando's fracture. All right, so this is what is called as Rolando's fracture. So this is how you differentiate between Bennett and Rolando. You can very well see that there is an avulsion fracture of tip of spinous process of C7. Avulsion fracture of tip of spinous process of C7. By the way, let me tell you it can involve T1 as well, but C7 is more commonly involved as compared to T1 and this is what is called as Clay Schobler's fracture. <clears throat> now moving over to the next fracture, you can see an H shaped sacral fracture. This H shaped sacral fracture is basically what we call as jumper's fracture. 
all right so that is what is called as jumpers fracture if you see this intra articular fracture of calcaneum if you see this intra articular fracture of calcaneum then this is what is called as lovers fracture also called as Don Juan's fracture and I want all of you to remember at least one thing that in fracture of the calcaneum we use two angles one is called as Bowler's angle other one is called as Giesen's angle Bowler is usually decreased while Giesen's is usually increased always remember this now certain important one-liners most common site of non-union in the entire body is fracture of the distal one-third of the tibia. It is not a femur, it is not scaphoid, it is not talus, it is distal one-third tibia. Most common cause of non-union is not inadequate reduction, not inadequate immobilization, not poor blood supply. It is not inadequate reduction, not inadequate fixation, not poor blood supply. It is inadequate immobilization. The radiologist gets to know when there is first radiological sign of union that happens that is basically callus also what is called a soft callus and technically let me tell you it appears at third week of the fracture healing well the first clinical sign of union through which an orthopedic surgeon a clinician gets to know is basically formation of woven bone which is nothing but the heart callus which normally occurs at fourth to sixth week of the fracture healing so technically i want you to remember that radiological healing precedes clinical healing three important mcqs most metabolically active layer in a normal long bone endosteum it is not periosteum the first long bone to start ossifying that is clavicle the second bone to ossify after clavicle by intramembranous ossification mandible after these facts there are three more facts number one the most pain sensitive structure of a joint we have already discussed about this in our lectures that whenever you have a joint that is packed in a polybag and that is called as capsule so most pain sensitive structure in a joint i repeat most pain sensitive structure in a joint i repeat answer is capsule most pain sensitive structure in a joint the answer is very simple straight and clear it is capsule least pain sensitive structure in a joint that is basically a structure which has no blood supply no nerve supply no uh, you know lymphatic supply does not possess even perichondrium of its own that is articular cartilage Menisci are basically fibrocartilaginous structures which are made up of type 1 collagen. Do remember this. What do you think? I can think that it is not epiphysis, it is not infysis, it is in metaphysis growing away from the bone, growing away from the joint, a projection of the growth outside the bone, the most prominent bone tumor, not a true bone tumor, which has a bony stalk, which has a cartilaginous which has a bony stalk which has a cartilaginous cap which is seen in boys more than girls which is seen in skeletally mature people the most common benign bone tumor as i said but not a common bone tumor as i said but not a uh, most common benign bone tumor but not a true bone tumor so answer is osteochondroma or exostosis and if you see this of course femur is there neck is involved just below the neck inner border diaphysis where you can see this central radiolucent lesion called as nidus the diameter of which is less than two centimeter which is abundantly filled with prostaglandins which is surrounded in periphery by a thick reactive sclerotic rim and that thick reactive sclerotic rim is what is called as osteoma so you have a osteoid in the center surrounded in periphery by osteoma 20s to 30s most common location is shown to you night pain is classical aspirin and relief is magic if you see this then of course you can see that this is the periosteal reaction so this is the periosteal reaction along sharpie's fibers so this is the periosteal reaction along sharpie's fibers this is what is called as sun ray or sunburst appearance so periosteal reaction along sharpie's fibers sun ray sun burst appearance the findings are probably seen in this condition called as osteosarcoma i mean primary osteosarcoma secondary osteosarcoma primary is more common four p's first p pain second p pathological fracture third p periosteal reaction along uh, sharpie's fibers sun ray sun burst appearance and the fourth p what is the fourth p which is seen here codeman's triangle so this codeman's triangle is basically nothing but periosteal elevation this codeman's triangle is basically nothing but the periosteal elevation now this is codeman's triangle there's one more thing called as codeman's tumor codeman's tumor is another name for chondroblastoma 
anyhow now if you see then very simple there is uh, there is this physis involvement is in metaphysis by the way this is the fallen leaf or a fallen fragment sign so i am talking about a simple bone cyst a solitary bone cyst a unicameral bone cyst as the diagnosis and i'm sure all of you are aware of it that proximal humerus is involved metaphysis is involved boys more commonly involved as compared to girls age group is usually 4 to 14 years usually asymptomatic incidental diagnosis and you know a cavity which is lucent and typically lytic that is basically simple bone cyst now if you see this <clears throat> definitely the distal femur is involved definitely the physis is not there so patient is skeletally 100 percent mature usually age group is 20 to 40 usually age group is 20 to 40 aunties are more commonly involved as compared to uncles uh, epiphysio metaphysial lesion if you see the beauty it is definitely epiphysial but still not extending into the joint line so this basically extends up to the articular margin so this extends up to the articular margin you can see a geographical destruction you can see a geographical lytic lesion now this geographical lytic lesion that you are able to see this geographical lytic lesion that you are able to see this is basically nothing but a large airfield sinusoid and this large air filled sinusoid is what is called as so bubble appearance on an x-ray I'm sure you all have understood we are talking about DCT osteoclastoma you can see that epiphysis is not involved physis is not involved metaphysis is classically involved just like SBC here also metaphysis is involved so just like SBC metaphysis is involved usually proximal tibia is involved patient is skeletally immature physis is usually open physis is usually open i mean 10 to 18 years is the age group girls are more commonly involved as compared to boys this is more locally invasive this is more locally aggressive there are multiple blood filled sinusoids which i am sure you all are able to appreciate and then there are something there is something which is interesting here that then there are septa in between so i'm talking about which condition here come on speak up i'm talking about which condition here that is abc all right so these are the small blood filled sinusoids with well defined septa in between does it make some sense to you so SBC, DCT and ABC. Now when we talk about osteoarthritis, I'm sure you all are aware of the X-ray signs of osteoarthritis that the first X-ray sign is always reduction of the joint space. Whether that is symmetric or asymmetric, that is always asymmetric. Now when I say asymmetric, that simply means that medial narrowing is more commonly seen as compared to the lateral narrowing. Of course, after that, you will see these bony spicules, which are called as the osteophytes. Eventually, they break up into maybe sooner or later into the free loose bodies. And then if you see, then this whitishness is called as the sclerosis. Sometimes you see accumulation of the fluid inside. That is what is called as the subchondral cyst formation. Eventually, the entire joint space will be gone. Now, what are the important one-liners in osteoarthritis? The most common joint involved is knee. In knee, most common bone, patella. Most common muscle, quadriceps femoris. In quadriceps femoris, vastus medialis. In vastus medialis, vastus medialis obliquus. The initial symptom is always pain. Most common deformity is genuverum. Paukhar node is a deformity in PIP. Her burden node is a deformity in DIP. I used to get a lot of confusion. So I remembered it like this that blood pressure sooner or later leads to heart disease. So Paukhar is PIP. Her burden is DIP. Always remember this. You can very well see Paukhar PIP. Her burden DIP. So guys, uh, this was the complete revision of the final lap of orthopedics that i wanted to do in a very quick and a crisp manner so that so that i mean whatever um, whatever things that you have just seen they are probably the most high yielding elements of orthopedics and are definitely going to give you some sort of mcqs 
I wish you all the best. Keep yourself calm, cool, composed. Have faith in your preparation. Have faith in the entire process that you have followed till now. Have faith in the hard work. Have faith in the destiny. Everything will be fine. Just don't worry. And just ensure that, you know, whatever uh, <clears throat> vision and whatever picture that you have in your, you had in your head when you started this journey of becoming a doctor, you will keep that into your mind before stepping your first foot into your examination hall, into that computer center where you're going to go and go and, going to go and give that exam. Just make yourself uh, comfortable uh, with the environment first. Try to reach in time, rather try to reach before time. You have to ensure that, you know, you do not invite any unnecessary hassle of being over there a little late and not you know um, take your admit card print out and just have full proper breakfast and sleep properly i mean all possible comforts that you can avail for yourself you have to do it because at the end of the day you are your most important priority till the day of exam and of course even after that so i wish you all the best and i just hope that you know you people get whatever you want and all of you just stay calm and composed till the time of exam i know this is a time which gets onto your nerves but you have to take hold of yourself and your position and people around you god bless all the best all the best for your exam i wish you all the best thank you